now have the pleasure to announce the first keynote. Um, actually, somebody I've you know always looked up to. Bradley joined actually uh, uh, before he joined Google, and he had a long career at Google. He was at Yahoo uh, in the really you know early internet days. At Google, he ran products that we all I think use and love, like Google Photos, which I consider one of the best Google products of the last five to ten years. But also Gmail, Google Docs, Google Workplace. And now he started a venture company called Wisdom Ventures. And his talk, his keynote, is all going to be about uh, innovation and how to make it happen. Bradley, please come on stage and take it away. That um, walk-on music is more ominous than I was <laughs> expecting. Um, so first of all, I want to thank the organizers. This really is like a family. I've had an incredible welcome. Last night, I got a chance to meet some of you, and I'm looking forward to spending the day with you today. So I'm really feeling that family, tribal connection. Um, so the talk is going to be about leading through uncertainty, and we definitely live in uncertain times. Um, the idea uh, when I made this slide was that I would come up here and say, for instance, the closest election in US history, it will be weeks before we even know who won. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem as close as we were expecting. So maybe there's a different lesson behind this side about don't trust the data. Um, but um, I'm gonna get this slide off the screen as quickly as possible. Um, but irrespective of whatever happens back home, um, it's pretty clear we're in in uncertain times and teetering uh, both at a global level but also within the locality of our own work as uh, tech leaders. Um, this uh, is Jack Dorsey. I don't know if any of you have had a chance to meet or work with Jack Dorsey. He is the co-founder of Twitter as well as Square, now rebranded re as Block uh, as he's become interested in uh, blockchain technologies. This is me and Jack. It looks like we're best friends. We barely know each other, but we bumped into each other in a strange context. So we did the selfie thing. Um, that is how he looked 10 years ago. He looks, I look exactly the same, right? Um, <laughs> He looks different. <laughs> um, he has gone full on blockchain. But um, the point I wanted to make here was not Jack's um, transformation, but rather um, news came out last week that was pretty stunning. One of the things he did through Block was acquire a music streaming service called Tidal. And um, Tidal has obviously not lit up the world and really given Spotify a run for the money. Uh, so it's going through layoffs, as many companies are. But what I thought was stunning is it, it laid off the entirety of the product management function. He just dismissed the product managers en masse. So that's pretty scary, um, as many of us in the room are product managers. Um, at least we have safe haven in um, you know, coding and that kind of work. Um, but wait, maybe we don't. Um, Google absolutely crushed earnings last week. Um, the stock had a 5% bump. 5% of $2, two trillion is $100 billion. We sort of added $100 billion of market cap. But there was a very interesting uh, comment that Sundar made in the um, earnings call. 25% of Google's code is now written by AI, not people. And in case that implications of that aren't clear, it's ringing an alarm for software engineers. It's not clear that you can hide on the, the more technical engineering side of the fence either. So there's definitely a lot of uncertainty in the air. Have I got your attention now? <laughs> Good morning. Um, so I'm gonna do this talk in three parts. The first is really gonna be around wisdom. You heard I've started a venture firm called Wisdom Ventures. And so I've been thinking a lot about that word and about the nature of wisdom. And I'm gonna share some of my thoughts with you. Um, wisdom is hard to talk about, um, partly because it sounds patently obvious and it largely is things you already know. Um, and that is the danger. In the familiar, you sometimes gloss over it or dismiss it. So I really invite you to sort of keep an open mind, lean back and see which parts, if any, of this talk ring true for you personally. So about 
25 years ago, I first made this pyramid. And to be clear, um, about a thousand other people in the world have made a pyramid that looks like this. This is not a, a huge insight or great discovery, but I've always loved it as a framework. And sometimes the labels there have changed over the years. But I thought about my own work in this way, about, you know, first learned about signal processing. Then as I studied computer vision, the name of the game was moving up the pyramid, taking the raw signal, the pixel level data we got in camera sensors, and trying to construct meaning and knowledge out of that. And as you rise up, um, you know, there's a bunch of things that are sort of subtle in this diagram. One is that there is far more data and signal than there is wisdom in the world, because this is a process of refinement. You can also think of the color, sort of data is dense and wisdom is uh, refined and very, very pure. There's less of it and it's more sort of concentrated. So I, I love this pyramid and have fallen back on that to think about a lot of the work I've done over the years. So the nature of this talk is um, not going to be sort of like, here are 17 things you need to scribble down and take notes about. It's not that kind of talk. Not that there's anything wrong with that kind of talk. There may be talks like that um, later in the day. And in fact, those can be incredibly valuable. We don't denigrate or, or think of signal or data or knowledge in any less value than, than wisdom. In fact, wisdom is derived from that. But this talk is going to be a little bit different. And I'm going to focus a little bit more on wisdom. So I mentioned um, it's hard to recognize wisdom when it walks in the door. Um, I love the title of this book. I've actually never read the book. I think everything I needed to know I got from the title. Um, but I love the statement that a lot of what is wisdom is innate to us. It's sort of recognizable. It's not um, esoteric or um, unfamiliar. It's actually very, very clear when we sort of clear out our thinking and, and get out of the way. Um, and, you know, if you think about physics, um, and my father-in-law is actually a physicist. As you sort of climb up the period, uh, the pyramid of physics, at the very top there is the theory of everything. Physicists are still searching for the grand unified field theory, the one equation that explains every other phenomenon we see in nature. Um, so, you know, probably the simplest bit of wisdom is the golden rule. Very, very simple. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you, which is great and familiar to all of us. Um, but I love this quote that I stumbled upon. There's nothing original about the truth. It hasn't been recently invented. The longer a person knows something without applying it, the harder it is to apply. Once the mind thinks it knows something, it becomes rigid regarding that subject, and it makes that it makes it difficult to learn or experience anything new. So keep that in mind. So the wisdom these days is not coming from profits, it's coming for, from for profits like Nike and Apple and Google and uh, Facebook. Um, these are the wisdom of our age and um, you know, they're great and they're inspirational messages. When I hear just do it, I think about um, getting out of my own way, not you know, analysis paralysis, but just acting. Of course, you know, sometimes that's a good idea, but if, if you know, you're jumping off a bridge, it's a very bad idea. And part of the problem with wisdom is that for every single aphorism, there is a corresponding duel. You know, so you can sort of scan these. And, um, you know, just like you can invoke one, you can easily invoke the other one. And so wisdom is sort of having the intuition and the life experience to know which of these to apply in any given moment. Part of wisdom is really around provenance. Where is the information coming from? And I love this ad campaign. I don't know if any of you are old enough to remember the Think Different ad campaign for Apple. Um, not only did they invoke think different, but they invoked examples for us to contemplate about um, how we should think different. Does anybody recognize everyone in the image? Um, I didn't. I had to do some reverse image search on Google. Um, number one there is Maria Callas, and the other one I needed help with um, was Martha Graham, uh, the choreographer down there. So provenance matters. If I showed you this watch, it's an Omega watch. It's a Swiss watch. The very best watches in the world are Swiss. It's a very nice and very valuable watch. 
But if I told you this very watch was on the wrist of, um, it's nice to see a, a, a great American president up on the screen, um, of John F. Kennedy, you know, suddenly the watch takes on new uh, value beyond just the, the metal and then the leather. Um, suddenly that becomes of historical significance. And it's a really interesting phenomena I've thought about and mentioned many times. Provenance matters. Where something comes from, the history behind uh, an object or information actually matters a lot. In fact, um, I was recently in Berlin last week and stumbled into a display that actually showed a watch that was valuable only because of its provenance. Um, it was a watch that was given to the workers that actually constructed the building that I was in, and they had it on display there. So I thought that that was uh, an interesting validation of the point. So that's me and my dad. Um, my, I'm the younger one, um, when we were kids. And I remember as I was a budding executive in Silicon Valley, I would often have a bit of a commute, 20 minutes, 25 minutes on the way home. And I would ring my dad and seek advice. And I would explain to him uh, what was going on at work and some of the politics and the dramas I was experiencing. And Mostly I was hearing myself talk. My dad at the end would you know, do his best to dispense advice. He was not an executive. In fact, he was not even college educated, but he had a certain kind of folksy wisdom. But mostly when my dad uh, got to the part of his opinion, I was in my driveway and said, I gotta go and uh, moved on. Later in my career, I had a chance to work with a fellow named Bill Campbell. And Bill Campbell is known as the trillion dollar coach because he was coach to our heroes like Steve Jobs and Larry Page and um, just an incredible group of Silicon Valley executives used Bill Campbell as a means of um, learning, as a sounding board and uh, developing strategy. And I was fortunate enough in my early days at Google to have many sessions with Bill. And I remember one in particular where, um, you know, these were rare for me. I didn't have a weekly appointment with Bill. I got to see him about once a quarter. And so I greatly valued those moments that I got to spend with him. And I remember in preparation for one of our sessions, I wrote and redrafted the script of the problem I was having. I wanted to be very efficient in sort of conveying to him out of respect for our time together. I wanted to really get it right. And so, uh, you know, I had my spiel that I had created to tell Bill what was going on with me. And so I get into the room with him and we shake hands and we, we sort of sit down and I launch into my spiel. I, I had it committed to memory, and I said, Bill, I'm having a problem with so-and-so. We just don't see eye to eye. He thinks one thing, I think another. We're having all kinds of these problems. And before I know it, you know, six minutes um, are up, and he looks at me and goes, fuck so-and-so, how are you? And I was completely taken aback, and um, I was sort of knocked off my game, and that, little gesture that he made was um, really important because partly it was to show me that all of that mental construct that I had created, the conflict and the problem I was having, was largely in my head. He basically dismissed with that and said, I don't want to talk about that. I'm not going to think about that. Neither should you. We then went on to use the rest of my 54 minutes with him to talk about something that was really happening in my personal life, which was I was about to become a stepfather. It turns out he is also a stepfather. He was also a stepfather. And so we spent the rest of the time talking talking about that role and that special opportunity to influence a child's life. And it became a really important um, lesson for me. And it was a lesson at multiple levels, um, not only what he imparted, but also how he made it real and sort of got rid of all the sort of problems I imagined I was having and brought it back home. And so this is another example of provenance. Bill wasn't actually telling me anything that was, you know, 17 secret steps I whispered to Steve Jobs about how to build Apple. He was dispensing the same kind of wisdom my father was, but because it was coming from Bill, I had ears to hear it and it landed in me in a very different way. So, um, Again, I'm going to invite you to, to sort of listen for what rings true for you today. Um, 
I'm going to switch gears now and talk a little bit about innovation. And um, there's a word, it's sort of an SAT word, um, a word I don't really use in daily life, but I've come to really like, and it's pronounced in newer. Um, and to become inured is to become accustomed to something, especially something that's undesirable. It's sort of like that stone in your shoe where you don't have the energy to sort of bend down and deal with it. You just keep walking and enduring it. It becomes sort of part of the background noise of your life. And I think this is important because becoming inured to things is what really inhibits us and stops us from innovating, innovating as product leaders. Um, and it really has to do with stuckness. How many of you recognize this image? Okay, only a handful. I'm getting some applause. This is an album cover of a band called The Cure. I actually had the privilege of seeing The Cure last week in London. They are fantastic. The reason I'm putting this up there is they have a song called Doing the Unstuck. And what I love about that is it turns the process of getting out of our stuckness into a verb. It's something you can actually do. And there are techniques for becoming unstuck, techniques for innovating that are tried and true over the ages, and I'm going to talk about some of them. So one of them is travel. I actually love travel personally. I grew up in the Midwest of the United States. I really didn't leave my hometown much as a child. Our family couldn't afford it. So now as an adult, I'm that kid that likes to stand in the middle of Zurich and spin around and, and look at everything. And uh, it, it really is profound and meaningful for me. In a product sense, Google had a business unit that it called Next Billion Users, NBU. And as it thought about its growth, we're really proud when a product has a billion users. Uh, Photos has a billion users. Chrome has a billion users. But where do you go from there? We needed to begin to think about where were the next billion users going to come from. And it was clear that these were in markets where Google hadn't really properly invested, markets like China or Brazil or India or Africa. And so one of the genius things that the leaders of the next billion users business unit did was do these things called immersions. And they would take people out of Mountain View in Zurich and transport them to Lagos, Nigeria. And when you got there, they took away your fancy uh, Android phone, um, or God forbid, iPhone, and they gave you a phone like the people there used, um, with its limits in storage and bandwidth and processing. And they really immersed you in the culture. We would go into these open air markets and try to buy a SIM card or um, figure out how to do side loading of apps and, and share. And these were incredibly valuable experiences because they taught us what it felt like to be on the ground using our products. And so in Mountain View and in Zurich, we are bathed in Wi-Fi. We have high quality networks. We have the latest in gear and phones. Um, that is not the case for the next billion users. And so this was a really profound and visceral experience. Everyone who went on these immersions came back and thought very differently about the products that they were building. And what was amazing is it had these dividends. So yes, it made the products better for the people in in Nigeria, but also, you know who doesn't have bandwidth? Me, when I'm on Swiss Air, or other scenarios where things are flaky on a subway or uh, in a tunnel. And so our products began to work in scenarios where things like ubiquitous high bandwidth wasn't assumed. And so it was an amazing dividend. Another thing you can do to uh, help innovate is think about accessibility. I always thought of this as sort of like a charitable act. We had to build our products for the blind and the hearing impaired and the mobility impaired. This was the right thing to do. We needed to include those users and bring them along. But what I later learned was this also had amazing dividends. For decades, we've been building things like screen readers and speech recognition, mostly as an accommodation for these differently able people, it turns out, you know who else doesn't have uh, uh, the ability to type? Me, when both hands are on the wheel. Um, Waymo's going to fix that. But in general, um, these have dividends for everyone. So this is another example of where something that was intended to address a subset of our users ended up having uh, tremendous value for all of our users. Another thing Google does, which um, is subtle but really important, is 
playing musical chairs. And by this, I mean um, when you used to get hired at Google, this isn't the way it works anymore, but in the old, old Google uh, culture, um, they didn't tell you what you would work on. You would go through a gauntlet of interviews, and if you were lucky enough to get a job offer, um, there was something called the allocation committee that basically assigned you where help was needed. So you would get accepted into Google, and then on day one, they'd say, congratulations, you get to work on maps. And what was so interesting about this is that we had really, really smart generalists who would come in without a lot of domain knowledge. Maybe that engineer had never thought about maps or never thought about mapping. And that wasn't seen as a deficit because smart people can quickly learn. It was seen as an advantage because they were bringing a very new and different perspective. Probably the ultimate example of this is a fellow named Linus Upson. Linus was one of the developers of Chrome, a billion users product. He did that for 10 years, declared victory, and went on to work uh, in eradicating the most dangerous animal known to man, which is the mosquito. He didn't have a lot of life science background at the time. In fact, he doesn't have a college degree, even in computer science. He's a college dropout. But Linus is brilliant and took on this problem without the baggage of those who had been working on epidemiology and uh, the, the sort of health uh, problem before, and has made great progress, and you can actually go to the website debug.com to hear some of the work that uh, Linus has done there. Another thing, and this sort of gets back to putting smart people in the deep end of the pool and seeing what happens, is going back to first principles. There's uh, an interesting book called Chip War, um, which I read, I actually listened to it, um, but it fascinated me that the chip supply chain has become a national security issue and a global crisis. It turns out there is one Taiwanese company, TSMC, that makes 50% of the chips in the world, and in fact, 90% of the advanced chips in the world. And if we sort of eliminated those chips, this talk would be over, the lights would go out, we'd be back in the Stone Ages. So we are all very, very dependent on the work that TSMC SMC does. What fascinated me about this is they didn't invent semiconductors. They don't even make the equipment that uh, builds the semiconductors. The way I think about it, they are sort of like the cooks. They are using Dutch and Japanese ovens that sort of come in. Those are the fabrication. They are using recipes that come from the United States and other nations, but they have 50 years of know-how in how to make chips. Um, there's a company called Atomic Semi. Uh, it is a new moonshot level company that is thinking about if we threw out all of those 50 years of know-how and started over with today's chemistry, with today's physics, with the advances, uh, Going back to first principles, how would we build chips? And this, to be clear, is a moonshot that will cost billions of dollars and take a decade, but it's become imperative. Another thing I love about this company is they paired up uh, someone who's been working on semiconductors for decades, Jim Keller, with a 22-year-old college dropout named Sam Zalouf. And again, sort of taking brilliant people unburdened by the, uh, the knowledge of how it used to be done and putting them against the problem yields amazing results. In fact, Sam is the CEO of the company, the, the young man. Um, another thing we can do to uh, innovate is change a constraint that we had assumed. And this is an example of how cars have gotten really, really boring. I don't know if anybody has noticed that. Seems like the only cars you have in Switzerland are uh, Mercedes and BMW. Um, but uh, if you're in the United States, all cars are sort of converging to the same basic shape. And there are many reasons for this. There's consumer preference, there's um, uh, supply chain issues, but the underlying reason is um, aerodynamics. Basically, we gas is expensive, the world is boiling over, we have climate change, and so cars are mandated to be efficient, both so they're economical, but also so that we are more uh, thoughtful about the resources we are using. So what if we change that constraint? What if petrol was cheap and we didn't have climate change anymore? What would cars look like? 
Well, we can run that experiment with a time machine. If we go back 50 years, this is what cars used to look like before we cared about fuel efficiency and climate change. And so you can sort of see the implications of changing that one constraint lead to wildly different innovations. Another example here is thinking about um, a technical constraint. This is the cost of storage over decades. You can see that it basically flatlines. You can't even see the graph. If we plot it against a log graph here, you can actually see uh, that the cost of storage is trending towards zero. What's genius about this, I mean, some of you may be old enough to remember um, in the 2000s when email used to be a task of tediously filing away every email you got. In fact, I would receive dozens of emails a day, I would stay late, and at the end of the day, I would close my laptop knowing I had zero inbox and could feel good about dinner and going home. Um, and then I would come in the next morning and there would be three new emails from my colleague in Japan or something like that. Um, obviously with storage diminishing to zero and the flood of information that was coming, Google, and in particular, uh, Paul Bukite, saw that that world was changing. And they revolutionized the email paradigm into a world where we knew we would be flooded with information. There would be more emails coming at us than we could possibly manually process. It would be a full-time job just to go through my email. And so Gmail, over the many years, has added features like filters, like priority inbox, infinite storage, strong search, that allow Gmail email to still function in this world where that constraint of storage was no longer limiting the volume of email, but instead exploding it into uh, what we know today. There are people who, as a profession, think about relaxing and changing these constraints, asking the question, what if? Um, Cat's Cradle is a book by science fiction author Kurt Vonnegut, and it postulates what would happen if uh, water froze at room temperature. Um, it's a fascinating book that I read as a teenager and love today. There's also um, shows like Black Mirror. Black Mirror is only six or seven years old. The first episodes came out then. And they are sort of near future, quite deliberately. They don't postulate a 50-year time frame, but they ask, what is the world going to look like in years? And what's fascinating about that is many of the things that were postulated uh, years ago have now come to pass and we've actually zipped by them. So things like what happens if VR becomes so realistic it's indistinguishable from real life or what if I could resurrect a loved one from their digital uh, trails that they leave behind or what if social currency equated to real currency. All of these things were explored in Black Mirror and have become uh, part and parcel of our lives now. Another great example that is now more than a decade old is the movie Her, which I thought was a great movie, very provocative, and it gets into issues of consciousness, issues of AI, um, issues of interface and relationship. It sort of explores what are the social implications of the technology on its runaway path. So another thing to think about is grinding versus uh, integrating. And grinding is an important part of the product process. We all have to do the work. We all have to pull the late nights and think about how do we polish this into a gem uh, worthy of our users. But sometimes, especially with respect to innovation, grinding is the wrong approach. My wife and I are fond of doing something called Spelling Bee. It's a casual game in the New York Times every morning. And basically, the game is to make words out of the letters on the perimeter that also include the central letter. So you can see some examples there would be took, T-O-O-K or look, L-O-O-K, or uh, take. Um, there's also this button on the bottom that allows you to um, shuffle the letters. And it's actually amazing to me that just switching the letters around, your brain kind of reorganizes and new words pop out at you. It's amazing. But there reaches a point when you are exhausted and you start grinding. And, you know, I'm sitting there doing permutations and com combinations of words that I know aren't words, but I've sort of entered a point where further manual effort is not only not helpful, it's just a waste of time and frustrating and not fun. Um, so the thing to do in those moments is walk away. Generally, if we go walk the dogs or step away or make breakfast or you know cleanse the mind, you come back and the words 
pop out at you. I'll show you. I don't know if any of you saw that. This is what they call the pangram, the word that uses all of the letters. So folktale pops out. And I've had this experience so many times where staring at the thing doesn't work. You need to step away from the problem to actually see it in context. And then this magical process happens. I think it's the same as sleep or dreaming. Um, sometimes stepping away from a problem is what's required to really give us the, the breakthrough. Another example of this is a movie. Um, it's interesting, we're here in a movie theater. My wife and I produced a movie uh, several years ago. Um, I'd never produced a movie before and never will again. But uh, someone came to us and said, I'm making a documentary about Brian Eno. And we were fans of Brian Eno. He is a music producer and really an artist of many mediums that um, uh, has produced David Bowie. I actually heard David Bowie as we were uh, waiting for this to start. U2, Talking Heads, he's uh, an acclaimed music producer, also does visual art. And the conceit of the documentary is that it's actually never the same twice. The documentary itself is a work of generative AI. It pulls from thousands of hours of archival footage and assembles a movie that has never been seen before every single time it's shown. So it's already been through Europe, it's been at the Sydney Opera House, it's been at Sundance, it will be coming around. We are trying to find a streaming distributor for this, but none of the streaming distributors can manage the underlying tech. So we're sort of wrangling with that. Netflix and YouTube are really good at sort of taking a an existing media artifact and distributing it to 20 million users. They're not good at making a new movie every single time it's shown. So one of the things that Brian Eno did, uh, he's not a virtuoso musician and barely works a, um, a soundboard, um, but he's a creative genius. And so one of the things he did was create a stack of index cards that lets people in all practices break through their stuckness. And they ask you to do interesting counterintuitive things like use an old idea or uh, honor the error as hidden intention. So these are incredible. You can buy this if you Google it. Um, I bought a stack. And anytime you're stuck, these are really good standbys that sort of invoke um, uh, ways to break through stuckness and get back to innovation. I wanted to comment briefly on renovation. One word that I've heard a couple times already is impact. And you might actually think about impact as innovation times scale. And the reason I bring it up is that Google, it's a very high bar. We are running a business with hundreds of billions of dollars of revenue. And oftentimes, as seductive as it is to think about what else could we do, sometimes if you just tweak the ads algorithm and improve yield by 1%, out pops a billion dollars. And so I think we all worship at the altar of innovation, but I think it's very important to think about innovation in the right context. Oftentimes, it's a spice. It takes something, changes everything, changes the flavor, makes it better, but you don't want to eat a meal of saffron. That is not you know, a sensible thing to do. It's not good for anyone. So innovation in context is, is an important lesson. So I want to switch gears one more time now, and the last third of the talk will focus on leadership lessons. Um, one thing people often asked me to do at Google was go on a career talk with them. And so people would find time on my calendar, they would show up at my door and want to talk about, you know, I'm a PM3, how do I get to the next level? And the philosophy I had at Google, and this was one that was imparted to me at Google, is I didn't like these career talks. I basically thought that every minute they spent focusing on the selfish intention of the next rung was a minute they weren't focusing on their product, their users, their opportunity. I told them it was my job to make sure the right things happen to the right people, and they should focus on their users and the work. Um, and so that's my first leadership lesson. It's a, it's a very high bar. It requires you to actually create a culture where that is true, where people don't have to worry about their career, but instead can keep focused on the problem. And then it's your job as a manager, as a leader, as a creator of culture to make sure the right things are happening to the right people. One of the personal stories I have about this was weeks into my experience at Google, I was sitting in a staff meeting with all of the power players in the product org 
at Google, Marissa and Salar and Susan Wojcicki. And eventually everyone had filed out and I was still taking notes. And I looked up and there was only one kid left in the room with me. Everyone had gone. And um, I asked him, I said, I'm new here. Would you mind if I asked you a couple questions? He goes, oh, absolutely. I said, is this meeting weird? And he goes, oh yeah, this meeting's weird. Just grit your teeth, you know, you'll get through it. I said, I've only been here a couple weeks, but I noticed your scope seems sort of small. You're just working on toolbar. It seems like you would have a bigger uh, responsibility here. And he looked at me with great compassion, like he was embarrassed for me. He goes, I don't think about things that way. I just do good work, keep my head down, and trust that the right things will happen. And of course, that person was Sundar, who is now in charge of everything. Um, and so the right thing certainly happened for him, but I was moved and impressed by the fact that he didn't angle for the next rung on the ladder. He made Toolbar as incredible as it could be, which led to him getting the responsibility for Chrome, which led to everything that ensued afterwards. And so that is our responsibility as leaders, is to make that true at your company. Another thing that's really important is modeling. This is a lesson that was imparted to me by Patrick Bichette, the former CFO of Google. Um, People are watching the leaders, and it's important you know, what you do in meetings. It's also important how you conduct yourself out of meetings, in the lunchroom, at the offsite. Um, in general, people are looking to you in ways that you really don't appreciate. Um, and, you know, I remember that there were people at Google, executives, who would make people line up outside their office. And I felt like that was incredibly disrespectful to uh, the time and energy of those folks. I ma maintained my own calendar um, such that uh, anyone who wanted in my organization, or frankly the company who wanted time with me, would get time. And I would end a meeting with my boss to make it to that meeting on time, because I respected time. And I think there's a lesson, how you do anything is how you do everything. You can't put a poster on the wall and say, we're a company that ships on time, but run your meetings 15 minutes late or show up to your meetings 15 minutes late. Either you respect time, full stop, or you don't. And that is not manifest in the posters or the vision statement or the jingo of your company. It's manifest in how you conduct yourself. People are watching. Another example at Google is free food. In fact, I stumbled into a, a conversation with Googlers this morning about the free food. We all miss the free food, those that were there. Um, what is interesting is I think of the free food as a perk. Obviously, it's something that people at Google enjoy, but it's also a cultural staple that goes beyond just um, the food itself. So um, ways it goes beyond that, one is Microsoft's, I think, invented the trick of don't let them leave campus. We'll give them food and haircuts and banking and dry cleaning, and then they'll never leave. We've got them captive and they'll code 18 hours a day. So there's part of that going on. Um, it turns out every Googler can afford to buy their food. In terms of an economic outcome, um, this is negligible. Um, in terms of a... Um, time outcome, actually waiting, I came from Yahoo, as was mentioned, actually waiting in line to pay for your food is a time sink. And so Google thought, and we do this with tech stops too, the ability if you need a cable, grab a cable. You don't have to fill out a form, you don't have to wait, grab a computer. Um, you know, that was a cultural statement. But more than anything, it really spoke to abundance. Um, Larry and Sergey were bored if you came to them and said, you know, uh, my product grew 14 percent last quarter. They really wanted you to take Google's resource and make a dent in the world with it. And so abundance is part of the subtext of what the free food was about. Another thing that's really important as leaders is that we honor and reward the unsung heroes. Every organization has these, whether it's the people who wear pagers and get beeped at three in the morning that there's a denial of service attack, or the people that are working on spam and abuse and have to clean up systems from bad actors. There's all kinds of people who do the work that isn't glamorous, it's actually barely noticed. A good day for them is nothing bad happened, you know, our systems didn't go down. And as such, they're very easy to forget. And I think it's the responsibility of leadership to remember them, to celebrate them, to reward them, uh, because what they do is essential to permission to innovate and everything else we do on top of their contributions. Another thing, and I uh, first heard this um, about six months ago at a conference, um, 
know what game you're playing. And these are sports analogies which are fraught, and these are American-ish sports. Um, baseball and basketball. Baseball has positions and specialization. You have a pitcher and a catcher, and uh, they're really not generalists. They're very specialized. Basketball is more fluid. Depending on the team you have and the moment, anyone can take a shot from anywhere in the field. And so part of what we do as leaders is, first of all, know what game you're playing, and secondly, construct teams that make sense given the talent that you have. Um, I like to tell people, I didn't build Google Photos, but I did build the team that built Google Photos. And part of that dates back to my original interview when I was looking to move from Yahoo to Google, I met with an interviewer who said, what's your product management philosophy? And I leaned back, because I didn't have one, so I had to come up with something, and I came up with a phrase called ruthless pragmatism. And he goes, oh, he was curious, what does that mean? And I says, it means you do what's necessary. If you have a really strong tech lead and everything's going great, your job might be to get her a Coke and dab the sweat from her brow, keep her coding. If there's a leadership vacuum, your job might be to elbow people out of the way and grab the wheel. Your job is to do what is necessary and appropriate given the context of the team. And so one of the lessons I learned from Bill Campbell and otherwise is to think about the team as a unit, not just great individual players, but how do you put them together to complement and compensate for each other in ways that you start to think about teams? Part of that um, ability to build teams, one of the lessons I learned as an entrepreneur, so before I went to Yahoo, I was a founder and grew a company and took it public. We went through the layoffs of 2000. Very painful. People had left other great jobs, come into my company, and we had to lay them off. Um, the economics just dictated it. And people got emotional. People got mad um, because they had made sacrifices, but it was non-negotiable. We had to do it. And I learned some incredible lessons from that experience. Even the people who were mad, when I saw them 10 years later, often came up to me and said, that was the greatest thing that ever happened to me. I, I took six months off, I went to a beach in Thailand, I met my future wife, look at our kids, aren't I a lucky man? Or uh, some people said, I went from our company to this other company, um, and I was employee number 34. That company was Google, you know, very good outcome. Basically, um, you can't handcuff people to positions. If it's not working for you as a leader, it's not working for the company, it's not working for the team, and whether they know it or not, it's not working for them. You do them a huge disservice keeping them into a situation which is dysfunctional. It is your responsibility as a leader to move them out, and that can mean firing them, it can mean moving them to another team or another project, but you are really responsible for taking that action. And that's what gives you the degree of freedom to actually build a team. In a basketball team, there's five people on the court. In a company, you have certain fixed headcount, and the only way to get slack pun intended, Archana, um, is to uh, create opportunity to re refill those positions. So this is a superpower. In fact, once you realize you have the ability to do this, um, you have to be responsible with it. You cannot capriciously move people out. Uh, but once you discover that you have that power, it's incredibly uh, valuable. Um, finally, my, my last remarks are really around uncertainty. I mentioned that we're leading through uncertainty right now. And um, you know, the idea is not that you come armed with a map. Any of these moonshot problems, we don't know collectively how to get there from here, and that's okay. It's actually not important to have a map. You don't have to pretend you have a map. What you have are the tools. You have the toolkit you've developed over years of study and curiosity and understanding that app actually helps you navigate. So all of the great discoveries of the new world and uh, the Vikings you know, are people who are brave enough to go into the unknown sensible enough to have others follow them. Um, and so think about uh, the toolkit you bring to the problem, um, and that's how you manage uncertainty. Um, and in fact, without uncertainty, it's not even leadership. That is what leadership is, the definition of taking people through these challenging times and these challenging moments. If you're just in the front of the line, you're not leading. Thank you.